Good afternoon and welcome to worship at Atherton Place. God is good to have joined us in this occasion in which we worship him, seek after him, and honor him by studying his word in order to know more about him for the ultimate purpose of coming to know him personally. In these days, we've been studying the names of God, and I don't know if this is good news or bad news, but this is the last sermon uh, in this series of 12. I hope that uh, these sermons have honored God and that he has used them to teach us all more about who he is and what his nature and character and function is all about. The lesson from the scriptures Today is from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, and please, if you have your Bibles, turn there and listen to the Word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but, neither disi- but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the funeral cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded by itself separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first and went also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to be risen from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the other at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, Mary said, Sir, if you have carried his body away, tell me where you have put him, and I will come get him. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. This is the word of God. Now pray with me before I preach. Dear Father, we thank you for the, your word and how you use it to bless our lives and to guide our lives and to show us who you are and show us who in you and through you we can be. Come and honor your word and give me grace to preach it and your people grace to hear it. For Jesus' sake, amen. Early on Sunday, the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. But Mary didn't go there in eager anticipation of resurrection. Rather, 
She went there in grief and disappointment. Her Lord had been crucified, was dead, and buried. Finding the covering stone removed and his corpse gone, she ran to Peter and John. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. The they she referred to was probably the Roman soldiers, or perhaps the guards stationed there by the Jewish Sanhedrin. In that assignment of responsibility, of course, Mary was wrong. Neither the Romans nor the Sanhedrin guard had taken his body. Rather, good news, good news, good news. God had resurrected his body, supernaturally raised him from the dead, miraculously restored him to new life again, and sent angels to remove the stone so that he walked out victoriously alive forevermore. But Mary didn't yet know that. So after Peter and John went home, Mary tarried, crying in abject grief and confusion. Then she peered into the tomb once more, where she saw two angels seated where Jesus' body had been. When the angels asked her why she was crying, she repeated what she had told Peter and John. They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. Then she turned around and saw Jesus. But somehow, she didn't realize that it was Jesus. She didn't recognize him. Even when he spoke to her, she didn't realize it was him. She supposed him to be one of the gardeners and asked where Jesus' body had been taken. Then Jesus called her by name, Mary. And it was when the master called her by name that she recognized him and addressed him, Rabboni. In the unimaginable joy and ecstasy of that moment of recognition and realization, Mary fell to her knees and took hold of Jesus. Then Jesus said, do not hold on to me. Go instead to my brothers. What the risen Savior was saying was, don't go on clutching me to yourself in your newfound joy. Instead, go and tell the good news to others. Friends, there's something about good news. It needs to be shared. Mary did that. She left her place of worship to go and share the great, grand, glorious good news. I have seen the Lord. At that moment of realization and recognition, when Jesus called her by name, Mary addressed him as Rabboni. Rabboni is a name that means teacher, but it's much more than we mean in our day when we think of teachers. In our time, we think of teachers and pupils in classrooms or schoolrooms. But in the Bible times, Rabboni meant someone who was much more than a teacher in a school or a teacher of pupils. Rabboni meant one revered as a maker of disciples, a leader of faithful followers, one who is a model motivator. It was a title of honor and respect that Mary deemed appropriate for the divine one who had conquered death. Therefore, in this instance, Rabboni became one of the names of God. God's names are important in the scriptures. They are important because God wants us to know him. Not just know about him, but also to know him personally. So that we may come to know him in person-to-person -person relationship, God reveals himself to us. And one of the ways that God uses to reveal himself to us so that we may know him is by telling us his names. For in the Bible, God's names are descriptive. That is, they tell us who he is as they describe distinctive aspects of his essential nature, character, and function. We have said in this series that knowing God's names is important 
because his names tell us who and what he is. And in addition, God's names tell us who and what we are when we're in right relationship with him. When Mary called Jesus Rabboni, she was acknowledging him as her teacher and master and Lord, but she was also acknowledging herself as his disciple and faithful follower. Please remember this. Anyone who calls another Rabboni acknowledges that one as their teacher, master, and Lord, and at the same time acknowledging themselves as one, that one's disciple and steadfast follower. If Jesus, the resurrected Christ, is our Rabboni, then that means that we have recognized him as our teacher and our master and our Lord and have committed ourselves to faithfully following him, not just as his pupil, but as his disciple. A Christian disciple is one who has made a commitment to follow the resurrected and living Lord Jesus Christ because he is our Rabboni. Think for a moment what it means when we call the resurrected Lord our Rabboni and follow him as his faithful disciple. It means we trust him enough to follow in his steps. We trust him enough to live according to his ways, and we trust him enough to obey his words and commands. It means we follow him whenever and wherever and however he leads. We follow him in life, and listen to this now. Raise your hand if you're not. I want you to hear this. We follow him not only in life, we follow him beyond life, even in death. In this year at Atherton Place, we have all had friends and loved ones who died. These deaths have affected and impacted our lives in various ways. We have tried to stand in faith and comfort with friends, family, and others who have experienced the sadness that comes with the death of loved ones. These shared experiences remind us dramatically of the fragility of life and of the certainty of death for us all. One time Jesus was talking to his disciples about this subject. He was talking to them about death. He told them that they, they need not be troubled in the face of death because there was life beyond death for those who trusted and followed him. In my Father's house, that's heaven, are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that where I am, there you may also be. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is saying that the way to the Father, the way to the Father's house, the way to the place he has prepared, the way to heaven is by following him. Don't you see? To call Jesus our Rabboni is to be his disciple and follower and follow him wherever he goes and leads. And listen, listen to this now. It is in following Jesus in this life and world that sets us on the pathway to follow him in the life and world to come. That's so important, I'm going to repeat it. It is in following Jesus in this life and world that sets us on the pathway to follow him in the life and world to come. MacDonald Clark writes, Death to a Christian is but passing through a dark entry from one little dusky room into a larger, brighter, fair, more glorious room in the Heavenly Father's house. Those who follow Jesus in life will follow him in death to new life, 
beyond death. But here's the question. How can someone expect to follow Jesus in the life and world to come if they aren't following him in this life and world? William Thackeray wrote, Life is the soul's nursery. It's training place for the destinies of eternity. That's another way of saying following Jesus here sets us on the pathway to follow him there. In the person of our Rabboni, the death-overcoming Lord Jesus Christ, we see that our God is a God of life, life abundant and everlasting. Speaking of the word that was God that became flesh in Jesus, it was said, in him, in Jesus, was life. The life that became incarnate in Jesus Christ. The life that God is and gives. The life that Jesus' resurrection confirms is more than biology, zoology, or physiology. It is eternal life which is real life, true life, resurrection life, life of such nature and character, even death has no power over it. That is the life that the Lord Jesus Christ always manifested, but never quite so dramatically as when he conquered death in the grave on that first Easter Sunday. And it is that life, resurrection life, eternal life, that Jesus promises to share with any and all who will trust in him as their personal Savior and faithfully following him, follow him as their living Lord. The gospel of Jesus Christ is centered in three historical events. His birth, his death, and his victory over the grave. Theologians call those the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. Each of these events tells us something special about God. In Jesus' incarnation, we see that God is a God who cares and who comes. In Jesus' crucifixion, we see that God is a God who vicariously, substitutionally, sacrificially dies in order to ransom and redeem. In Jesus' resurrection, we see that God is a God of life, real life, true life, everlasting life. And the gospel stands on these three legs, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection. And listen, if any one of those three, even one of those three is not true, then the gospel ceases to be the gospel, the good news. Friends, without the incarnation, there is no gospel. Without the crucifixion, there is no gospel. And without the resurrection, there is no gospel. Without the resurrection, there is no hope of forgiveness, no hope of redemption, no hope of salvation, no hope of life after death, no hope of life beyond the grave, no hope of heaven. Don't you see? It's Jesus, resurrection, victory over death and the grave that makes the gospel such great, grand, and glorious good news of life. When Mary went forth to tell the good news to the other disciples, she exclaimed, I have seen the Lord. She had encountered the Lord personally. Brothers and sisters, that's the good news of Easter. I have seen the Lord. And that, friends, that's the essence of what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is one who can testify with genuine assurance I have seen the Lord.